So, you know, um, you mentioned, you know, we saw each other again um, uh, down in Kansas City at the NAIC um, um, Insurance Summit. And obviously, regulation and innovation, which uh, I put out a blog yesterday around kind of the, the thoughts of that. And, um, you know, I'd love to get your view on, um, you know, how has, um, um, you know, innovation changed um, the view, uh, regulators' view? You know, I think they're much more open to, you know, some different things now that really there's a partnership that can happen there between innovation and regulation that can really help um, push this industry forward. And I think, you know, from AM Best um, scoring metrics um, that they're proposed out there uh, on, on innovation input and innovation output, uh, but also the sandbox concept, you know, that the NAIC, NAIC has been talking about for two years and now Kentucky is um, approved it. Um, I, I, you know, when I was there, I talked to some people and they were like, oh, you know, nothing's really going to happen with that. And I was like, oh, I think something interesting things could happen, you know, with regard to that, um, it could attract some interesting opportunities for people wanting to base their businesses in Kentucky. And that could be a, a place that they start um, introducing some interesting new products in that Kentucky sandbox. And I think it could evolve into that. But I'd love to get your views on that, Rob. I was so pleasantly surprised, Denise. This was my first time at. So I have been to NAC events before, and um, but this is the first time that I had been to the the summit, and um, it was one of my favorite conferences. I had never been to Kansas City before, and it was a wonderful town. Uh, far exceeded my expectations, and uh, I did get some quality barbecue. Uh, but they had a wonderful art museum. And there was a lot going on in Kansas City, much more than I appreciated. And uh, the conversations that I had with, with regulars, uh, to your point, they really wanted to uh, know kind of the perspective of what's out there. They were very open to dialogue. Um, some of the panels were terrific. Uh, you know, I was on a panel with Nick Gerhardt, who's a former uh, commissioner uh, of the state of Iowa. No, I loved it. Yeah, I love Nick. He's great. And I look at something that um, like Des Moines, right, as, as, as not somewhere that maybe stereotypically you would think about innovation in the way that you think about a New York City or a Silicon Valley um, or even up the road in, in Austin, Texas, from where I am here in, in my home in San Antonio. But uh, Des Moines has so much going on here. They've started the, the Global Insurance Accelerator. They've got uh, the, the GIS conference every year. And so you have this blend of uh, regulators and traditional insurers and startups that have really uh, created a very, uh, you know, uh, fervent kind of uh, innovative culture and community. And so they're all constantly talking and working together and, and uh, you know, bringing their diverse perspectives together uh, to really shape the future of, of innovation and insurance. And so I, I you know, my, message to many of them was, um, you know, really, I, I think uh, monitoring, continuing to have these robust dialogues is really important. Um, and there will be a place for regulation. But I think uh, what you don't want to do is is really, uh, you know, stifle some of this stuff until we can really see. So, so certainly concerned about outcomes. Uh, AI in particular is one, you know, uh, a lot of concerns about the ethics of AI and bias. And so I think that's something that definitely we need to um, be mindful of and kind of keep an eye on how can we make sure that we're kind of using data for good and AI for good. But at the same time, it does enable um, a lot more uh, processes. And quite frankly, I think it's going to allow, you know, new products, new services, expanded uh, uh, markets. So um, that seems to be a, a real common theme and to your point about uh, Kentucky kind of setting up the standbo sandbox um, I'm really hoping that other uh, other states will follow and, and what's great about our, our state-based regulation is that those guys do talk to each other and gals uh, talk to each other right um, and they are able to come together under the umbrella of NAIC they learn from each other absolutely yeah so I was um, you know walked away I, I think I always had a um, um, you know, uh, a, a respect and an appreciation for our insurance regulators, but but even more so leaving that. And one more thing I'll add, Denise, is I get this question quite often from startups of, um, you know, do I need to, to, to talk to the regulators? How should I engage the regulators? And I actually see startups that are maybe becoming MGAs that really don't need to become MGAs. They could kind of stay as a, as a tech play. And, and so I, I think there is some confusion out there among startups. I don't know if they're getting bad advice or they're kind of, you know, perceived the, the need and not to discourage anyone from, from going down the MGA route or the full stack route. But uh, so I always encourage them, even if they're a pure technology or data a provider that isn't necessarily 
necessarily looking to be, you know, some type of uh, licensed agent or, or licensed uh, corporation and admitted carrier. Um, talk to the regulators, explain their product and, and what it does and, and, you know, what you see the value chain is. The regulators are always happy to take the time to learn and to ask yeah. questions. And I think then um, if it, there is an agency or a carrier that later on wants to leverage your technology, you know, having that initial upfront conversation is going to pave the way. And, and if you uh, get some, some concerns or questions, you know, you can start a dialogue. I think a, a bad strategy is um, kind of, you know, uh, when consumers maybe start complaining or they hear something or they don't really know, right? And then you're kind of uh, playing defense uh, with the regulators. I think that's a bad place to be in. It doesn't mean that you can't yep. get out, but um, you can really kind of slow yourself down. So I know it, it may seem the fastest way is kind of to avoid the regulation. We see that, in, you know, for, for Uber and Lyft and right in some other kind of industries, Airbnb, where they've kind of skirted some of the regulators. But insurance is such a highly regulated product. It's such an integral part of the ecosystem. You know, I my advice is always to kind of engage um, up front and have a dialogue and you'll probably be presently surprised. The one last thing I'll add to Denise is that um, I see, uh, I, 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 I like this strategy actually from a lot of startups where they're actually starting uh, to, to, to set up business in states that are considered uh, traditionally to be a little bit more challenging from a regulatory standpoint. So I see folks starting in a New York or starting in California and once they get approval uh, to start, then it's much easier for them to kind of go to some other states and say, well, I've already mm -hmm. come able to set up shop in, in this state that is considered, you know, fairly rigorous from a regulation standpoint, um, whereas traditionally, I think many traditional insurers kind of say, well, I'll start in this, the, the states that are perceived as a little bit more friendly uh, and then kind of, you know, uh, address those states kind of at the, the tail end of maybe some new new product or, or new thing that I'm rolling out. Um, and I think it's really enabling the speed to, to market for some of these startups. So again, I think that's a strategy. Uh, uh, it maybe puts that strategy on its head, but I think it's really uh, proven yeah. that uh, they're able to, to scale uh, a little bit quicker by um, kind of, you know, having those initial conversations and starting in those states that um, might be the, the, the most uh, challenging to set up shop in. Yeah, I, um, I, I totally agree with you. And I think one of the really interesting things that um, I have found over the last couple of years is the regulators wanting to understand um, more so what their, their customers, their consumers in their states are, are asking. So I've actually had a number of calls with some of the, the state regulator offices with their team and going through our consumer and SMB research as to what, um, you know, the expectations are for these consumers. What kind of products would they be willing to want to have? What capabilities would they like? Uh, what kind of data would they be willing to share to be able to underwrite a, pro a product that is more personalized to their own personal uh, lifestyle or behaviors? And I think in that process, one of the most telling comments was from one state regulator is to say, wow, this is what our customers are wanting, and especially a new generation of customers, millennials and Gen, Gen, uh, Gen Z. We need to kind of understand this and listen to this and be a little bit more open to creating different kinds of products that are going to be aligned to different kinds of behaviors and risk profiles that haven't um, have, are, are no longer going to be there, you know, with this younger generation. And so I think the openness to, to listening to this and, yes, protecting their consumers, but understanding that their consumers are changing um, is, a, is a real kind of, I think, um, key moment, I think, for the, for the regulation uh, side of the business. Uh, and I think it opens up a lot of great possibilities. So, you know, with that, I, um, you know, one of the things that um, you kind of talk about um, in your book is um, creating a vision, survive and thrive through paradigm shift. Um, and, um, you know, where do you think some of the insurers should be placing um, the big bet, um, you know, from a vision standpoint to be able to survive and to thrive? Yeah, I really do talk about kind of betting strategy and, and um uh, the way I see innovation is as a discipline, not as a sideshow. So um, there are a lot of PR, there's a lot of press releases, there's a lot of people that want to have the appearance of innovating. Um, and uh, there's innovation is hard work, you know, it's a discipline. Uh, somebody asked me that, you know, can you really say that it's a discipline or are there best practices? And I said, you know, have you read any article in Harvard Business Review the last 10 or 20 years, right? Have you picked up any of these best-selling books on innovation? Um, there are absolutely 
good ways to go about innovating and bad ways, just as there are for underwriting claims, HR, IT. Um, so I think, you know, kind of l less the, the, the PR and more the really kind of getting into the, the, the weeds. And actually, I'm hearing more and more from leaders, you know, Rob, we're not just down in the weeds, we're actually digging in the dirt. And I love that term, you know, um, a lot of these small details are really critical to whether your innovative idea is, is successful or, fa or, or fails. The other thing that I would say is that you really need to focus on tying your innovation back to your strategy. So there's lots of buzzwords, blockchain, IoT, wearables, AI, machine learning, you know, all these kind of terms that are out there. And it, it, it's overwhelming if you kind of look at all the, uh, the the articles that are coming out daily and you see all these, you know, partnerships that are being formed. And that's one reason I wrote the book was to try to give some context to all the news that you're seeing out there and kind of, you know, really lay it out in a systematic way. And so, you know, those things may be make sense for, for, for one insurer, or one agent or it really doesn't make sense for another. So I think you need to be very mindful of your strategy and not try to do all of those things, not try to check the, I call it the, the innovation menu where you've got all these terms and you feel like you need to have a check by every box. You know, maybe for you, blockchain is two to three years away. Maybe you let that 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 uh, technology mature a little bit more, right? Um, but there right. are others, maybe variables make sense to, to jump in early, right? Because you think there's a competitive mm -hmm. advantage, certainly workers comp uh, perspective at AF group that's something that we think has you know humongous potential uh, for us and our strategy and the other thing that I would say about tying it back to your strategy and making sure that it aligns and you're not just kind of um, the pet project department and chasing down every idea that any executive has it doesn't mean those are bad ideas but it can really spread you thin and you really lose focus is taking your strategy and then going back to you know what is your view of the world uh, and what I mean by that is you know, let's talk about when we think autonomous vehicles are going to be on the road. And I understand that could be three years, it could be five years, it could be 10, it could be 20. You know, no one really knows. I think sometimes some weeks we see, you know, somebody says they're here before you know it, but at the same time, somebody else says, oh, they're a long way off. Um, so none of us has the answers, myself included on that, but I think it's important to state your assumptions. What do we think that that outlook is? And then what are the implications for our company? So if, and then stress test that scenario. So let's say, for example, you think autonomous vehicles are not going to be a big thing for 10 years, right? Um, well, if, you know, most of your income is coming from auto premium, that is giving you some time to really adjust the mix, right? So if you're Apple, right, and, uh, you know, uh, Mac sales are going down and you started the iPod, okay, what, you know, what, what does that transition look like? Okay, the iPod's going away and the iPhone is coming, right? What does that transition look like? So um, I, I think you can be very mindful, but then you also need to stress test and say, okay, well, what if it is here in five years and not 10? You know, how would we change our strategy? And through those kind of exercises, uh, testing your assumptions that feed into your strategy, I think that can kind of inform your innovation and where you place bets, where you go to, quote unquote, the adjacent possible, you know, some automation, uh, wringing expenses out of it, gaining some efficiencies versus, you know, new products, new services, um, and, and, you know, how much should I be spending on kind of, you know, RPAs and natural language processing versus um, kind of rapid deployment of new products using uh, platforms like Digital First and others. Yeah, we kind of we call it a, a really a two a two speed strategy. One is really around you know optimizing your current business and modernizing it so you can kind of take care of your business and uh, to your point you know really have some really strong operational results because you gotta you've got your current business your current customers you gotta take care of. Um, but then it's really about creating that new and um, you're doing that where you can hopefully have some in innovative um, uh, innovation that's really disruptive. And it's really rethinking, um, you know, where the where where the industry is going to be, where your customers are going to be, uh, what kind of risks they're going to be out there. Because, um, you know, ten years from now is going to be much different than the 1950s and the 1960s that we built a lot of these these current products. And we need to adapt and, and change with the times, not just kind of continue the same old same old, so to speak. So, yeah, I really like that. Absolutely. And we're also Go going Denise from a. Uh, uh, a batch processing world to a real-time world, right? So um, many insurers actually were fairly innovative and, and kind of early adopters of technology back in the 60s and 70s and had these big mainframes, right? Because it was perfect for, yeah. you know, process renewals overnight or, you know, you get a, a, a quote and an issue and so the policy starts at 12.01, right, the next day. Um, and 
you know, more and more we're going to this kind of real time world. So cyber threat, you know, you can't look at three to five years of historical data on cyber and say, well, I'm going to project forward what the cyber threats are going to be. No, the cyber threats today are vastly different than the cyber threats were three to five years ago. So yes, you can use some of that, right, to kind of model some scenarios out, but really, you know, there's, there's kind of real time and people are deploying kind of bots all over the internet to kind of check activity and you can kind of do some real time pricing. Uh, I actually uh, just came back from uh, Geo Insurance USA conference where Google's geographer, uh, Ed Parsons was there and he was saying they, they partner with a company called Flock in the UK that insures drones. And it was blown away by its real time insurance based on, you know, where you're located, what are the weather conditions, you know, is it cloudy, is it raining, is there wind, um, how long are you gonna fly the drone, how high in the air is the drone gonna be? And I was just blown away by all these different variables that go into the pricing algorithm all really at that point in time. Um, and yeah. so I think that transition from kind of a batch world to a real time world is something that uh, insurers and agents need to grapple with. Yeah, I think the other thing that I would say that ties into that is that it was a batch world because it was more of like a Henry Ford assembly line process. That's how we kind of thought about insurance. We did the quote, we did the, um, you know, the issue, we did the service. It was, uh, it was very much built around that batch assembly line process where today that assembly line process is, is really around an ecosystem and it's lots of different pieces and parts coming in. And in many ways you can kind of blow up the, the, the value chain as we've known it, that the value chain is really kind of a, an ecosystem of a lot of different things that are happening on a real time basis to your point. Absolutely. And I think you need to be able to enable, right, that, that, that just in time. So we talked about, you know, um, in the past, insurers would build an app and kind of hope that somebody would download the app and go to their app, right? And now we're seeing things like the e-scooters that are out there. And so being able to kind of offer insurance at the time that you're hopping on the scooter, right? Hey, do you want to be insured for an extra, you know, $2, whatever it is, right? Um, and so I think those are the types of kind of partnerships and really kind of, you know, more seamless interactions uh, that insurers need to be uh, looking to provide. It can't be, be oh, you're going to hop on the e-scooter. We'll make sure that you have our app downloaded mm -hmm. and hop over to our app and we'll insure you for the ride. Nobody's ever going to do yep. that, right? So doing yep. it in the moment exactly. uh, is really important and making sure that it's as, as seamless and as integrated as possible. Yeah, absolutely. So to wrap this up, could you give me one word or phrase to describe the future of insurance? My one word is exciting. And I know that a lot of folks may not think of exciting when they think about insurance. Uh, but, you know, what motivated me to write the book was absolutely all the things that I was seeing, all the exciting new technology, all the exciting possibilities. Uh, working in this industry has never been more thrilling or exciting. Uh, it's a really dynamic, uh, fast-paced environment today. And again, dynamic and fast-paced are not words that you would typically use to describe the insurance industry in the past. Uh, so I think over the next decade, you're just going to um, see like all sorts of uh, exciting new innovations from uh, the insurance industry. And um, I think it's going to be the end of insurance as we know it and look very, very different in the next five to 10 years. And I'm for one uh, and can't wait. I, I totally agree with you. And, uh, you know, having been in this industry for a long period of time, like you, um, it's, um, it's actually the most exciting time that I've been in this industry, which, um, is, is something to say, you know, because we, uh, it's a, it's a very different um, period of time, but there's a lot of things that have come together to really create something that is, um, you know, really even more valuable than where we've been because quite frankly, insurance underpins economies and under, underpins uh, businesses and it underpins, you know, people's lives. And it's a, it's a really important thing, but we need to adapt to a, a, a different world uh, and a different world of risk. So Rob, it's been, uh, it's been great. Um, I appreciate your insights today. Um, look forward to collaborating with you as an influencer in the industry, as we continue to kind of push this, uh, this industry forward into the future. So thanks so much for all of your insights. Congratulations on your book and um, encourage everybody to, to go and get that book and read it because uh, future, the future of insurance is going to be very different.
Thanks so much, Denise. It's great to be on. So for folks that want to know more about the book, uh, best way to find it is endofinsurance.com. Uh, it'll have some reviews, a summary, where to buy the book. It's available in both paperback and digital version exclusively on Amazon. And uh, if you do decide to purchase the book, uh, look me up on LinkedIn or uh, Twitter or Facebook or Instagram and let me know what you think. I'd love to hear from you. Great. Thanks, Rob.